trying to fit all this sourdough information in a 15 video because YouTube won't let me do it any longer than that. So here we go. The night before I know I am going to make sourdough, I go ahead and I feed my starter. My starter is very flat here, sitting at the bottom, not active at all. That is called a spent starter or the discard. So it has eaten through everything. It's not a happy camper anymore because it's hungry. So I'm going to feed it the night before so it can get nice and active. And that will give a nice, risen, fluffy sourdough when I go to make it the next morning. So I think I do, I don't know, maybe like a cup and a half here. You don't have to do that much. Um, I just know that after I make my dough or I'm going to go ahead and pour out what I need for my dough. And then I'm going to be making some pancakes or waffles along with it. So I need quite a bit. Then you want to mix in filtered water, enough filtered water to where everything is nice and moist. There's no dry, dry pockets of flour in there. I do keep my starter pretty thick, more thicker than a lot of other starters that I've seen, just because um, with pancakes and waffles, it does make them fluffier the thicker that I keep it. But I do want to make sure I have enough filtered water in there that is going to make have all of the flour that's in it nice and moist, nice and wet. You don't want the dry spots. So that's how thick I keep my starter. It is pretty thick. So now I'm going to be measuring out the amount of starter that I need. And my goodness, I lost where I wrote down the recipe here. Okay, so the starter that I am measuring out is 120 grams of active starter. So if you see here, active starter, you saw how um, how close to the bottom my starter was before I fed it. And now my entire half gallon jar is filled to the top with active starter. So when you see it double in your jar or even more than double like this one did and you have all the bubbles on the side that is a very happy healthy active starter and it's going to give you some very nice bread. Now you can't see the bubbles in my jar because of how dirty it is. I am going to transfer it to a clean one right here and um, I'll, I'll be able to wash that jar out. But yes, that jar did get kind of dirty because I use it so much. So that was 120 grams of the active starter. I do recommend using a scale, especially when you're doing sourdough, but with doing any kind of bread, a scale gives you the best results at the end. But if you're not using a scale, that should be around a half cup of starter. Then I'm going to be adding 310 grams of filtered water, which would be one and one third cups of water. And it's, you can do warm water right here. I did some warm water. I warmed it slightly on the stove or you can do room temperature water. Cold water gets a little difficult because it makes the starter cold and then it kind of slows down that fermentation process. So you do want at least room temperature water or slightly warm water. And uh, so I am going to add, so that just to go over it again, that was 120 grams of starter with 310 grams of water or a half cup of starter with one and one third cups of water. And I'm going to be mixing those together to get that starter dissolved as much as possible in the water. I have missed this step before and I didn't stir it and I just put everything in there and it was okay. So if you forget to mix it up first before you add the flour, don't freak out. Don't pour it out. You didn't mess up. It's okay. It will still work. But I have noticed that the times that I did remember to mix it, that it came out a little softer in texture, a little fluffier. It might not have been just because of that step, but I do believe that that step does make a little bit of a difference. Not enough of a difference to where if you don't do it, you screwed it up because you didn't. You're fine. Keep going with the process. But it is a little bit of a difference that you might, you might like it a little bit better. So I do try to remember to do that. So I did mix it up here. I use a Danish dough whisk. Use whatever you have. You don't have to buy anything special to do all this stuff. And you don't even have to use a stand mixer. You can do this all by hand too if you need to. So here I'm adding 500 grams of all-purpose flour. That would be four cups plus two tablespoons. 
around there anyway if you're trying to just measure it out with the cups. So 500 grams of all-purpose flour and then this is 16 grams of sea salt. We do use the Redmond's Real Salt. I do buy it in bulk. That's what I'm. That's my bulk container here that I'm scooping it out of because my shaker was out. And so 16 grams of salt would be two teaspoons of salt. And that's all you need to mix up the dough. You just go ahead and mix it until it forms a nice ball. In my mixer, I believe it was between five and 10 minutes, how long that I mixed it up to get this consistency here. So the dough, it is moist, but it's not super sticky. You see, like this is the entire dough here. It's stuck, um, it's stuck to the dough hook. <laughs> Couldn't think of the name and not the bowl. You don't want it sticking to the bowl. You want it making a nice ball. It is moist when you touch it, but it's not sticking to my finger super, super bad. So that's a good thing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let it sit on my counter all day to rise. And so I do cover it with plastic because since it is sitting for a long period of time, I don't want it drying out and forming a crust on top. So I'm covering it with plastic and then I'm also covering it with um, this fabric top here just to secure the plastic but you can put a heavy towel on top or use a rubber band whatever you have so it's been rising all day it might if you look at yours you're like uh, it's risen a little bit but not quite doubled it's okay you can still use it it's not it's not gonna rise like a dramatic amount within that short time like it would if you're making bread with active dry yeast so you can still use it. Mine rose a little bit, wasn't super crazy, but it did rise a little bit. So before I go to bed, this is now night, before I go to bed, I'm gonna go ahead and form it in my dough ball and stick it in the fridge. And it's gonna sit in the fridge to continue slowly fermenting overnight. So I have also done it where I just leave it on my counter for a full 24 hours and I don't do any fridge time. And to be honest, I've actually started liking the texture and the taste that I get doing it that way. So you can do this fridge step, or if you're like, no, I'm gonna wait till the next day and just leave it because I'm too tired, um, then go ahead and leave it because it, it will still do very well. So I floured the parchment paper here. You are gonna want it on the parchment paper and you'll see why in a little bit. And to form the ball, I'm just folding all of the rough sides up to one side. So you're going to have an ugly side and a pretty side. So you want to form a ball where you're pulling everything to one side, and that will be your ugly side. And then you want to get the top part of it nice and smooth and have a nice, smooth, firm texture. And that is going to give you a good tension and a good texture where your dough holds its shape but it has good tension while it's rising. And so that gives you a nice, good top to it. So, and you don't have to do it where you're letting it rise all day long and have to do the overnight part. You can, you know, like if you're, if you're wanting to put it together at night, then just go ahead and give your starter a fresh feed that morning and then put it all together at night and let it sit. So just whatever works with your schedule, but you do want a long enough time where your starter is gonna double and then you want to make sure you have a long enough time for your dough to ferment and, um, and get nice and active inside the dough before you actually cook it, if any of that makes sense. Hopefully it does. So what I'm doing here is I am tucking everything underneath. I have my pretty side on top. I'm tucking everything underneath. And as I'm tucking, I'm also pulling and twisting the dough a little towards me. And that's getting everything nice and tight and tucked underneath there. And so this pot that I'm putting it in, I'm, I chose this pot because it's the same size as the pot that I'm actually going to be cooking it in. So before you bake it, you're going to be heating, preheating the pot you're going to use in your oven. So the pot or bowl that I'm going to be putting it in in the fridge or whatever I'm keeping it in overnight on top of the counter is going to be different than what I'm actually cooking it in. But this pot is the same size, so I'm putting dough and parchment paper together inside my pot, and I'm folding the parchment paper down so I can make sure I can get this lid on here nice and tight, because it is going to go in the fridge. I don't want the fridge air to be on it, I just want the coolness of the fridge to slow down that fermentation process so it doesn't get too sour, if that makes sense. 
So the longer it ferments, especially fermenting at room temperature, the more bitter and sour flavor you're going to have from the starter. So put the lid on. I'm also going to wrap it in this plastic bag to really make sure that that refrigerator air is not getting to it. I'm going to put the whole thing in there and wrap it tight, get, get as much air out as possible. I'm going to fold this underneath and stick it in the fridge overnight. And I will take it out the next morning when I go to bake it. So here I'm going to go ahead and preheat the oven to 500 degrees and I am going to have the pot with the lid. You do want a pot that has a lid on it. Um, the pot that with the lid that I'm going to use to bake it in, I'm also going to put in that oven right now while the oven's preheating so it can come to temperature with the oven. So I am using my cast iron pot here that has the lid. You can use whatever you have, even the stainless steel pot that I had put it in in the fridge overnight, that can be used as well. If you don't have a cast iron or a Dutch oven or anything like that, you just need a lid. So uh, I am taking this out and I'm going to sit it on the counter while everything is heating up and it's going to start warming up slightly to where it's starting to come to room temperature but it's warming up enough to create some condensation. That condensation is good. That's going to help it steam even more in the hot pot and you want that steam because that steam is what is going to help it rise. If you form your ball, you take it out the fridge the next morning, you're like, this didn't grow at all. It's okay, it wasn't supposed to yet. It wasn't supposed to grow in the fridge, it's just fermenting in the fridge. So here, um, oh, what is it, scouring it, scorning it, whatever. One of those words, that's what I'm doing. That's not just to be pretty, that gives the dough a direction to go whenever it builds up that pressure to rise, it gives it a place to go. If you don't have any kind of slits in your dough, um, it, it will still rise, but there's so much pressure and nowhere for it to, no direction for it to go out of, that it will actually create a seam along the side all the way around your dough. And so to prevent that, you do want to have the slits on top. So I transferred it with the parchment paper. This is a very hot pot. That's why you use the parchment paper. I transferred everything to this hot pot, carefully put the lid on, and then I'm putting it back in the oven at 500 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes with the lid on. You want to keep the lid on for 20 minutes. I'm going to set that here. Okay, so now that the 20 minutes is over, I'm dropping the temperature to 450 degrees and I'm going to be taking the lid off. You'll see here when I take the lid off how much it has risen in the oven already. See, it's really expanded, really risen already. Still has a little to go, but that's what this next 20 minutes is for. My slits there did need to be a little bit deeper than what I did, but it's okay. So we're going to do 450 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes with the lid off. This is going to allow that, that crust to get nice and brown and it is going to do a little bit more rising as well. So now that the 20 minutes is over, I'm taking it out and I'm going to be placing it on a cooling rack with the parchment paper too. Now cooking with the parchment paper this high temperature, it does get really brittle. So a lot of times it just crumbles in my hands. Be very careful with that, that you don't actually touch the pot with your fingers and burn yourself because this, this is hot. So I'm going to be getting the cooling rack and then I'm going to lift the parchment paper and bread, everything out of this pot and I'm going to set it on top of the cooling rack. And so you can let it cool completely this way uncovered or if you want your crust to not be quite as hard, not quite as crunchy, then you can also wrap it in a towel like I'm about to do here because we do prefer ours. It, you are still going to have a crunchy crust, but it won't be like ridiculously crunchy. So if you wrap it while it's cooling, it's still warm. It hasn't cooled off all the way yet. And I'm going to wrap it in this towel. It's going to create a little bit of a steam to just soften that crust. You can also melt some butter and you can brush it with some butter as well and it will give you the same, the same consistency. So I hope I was able to answer everybody's questions here. If you um, still have any issues, have any questions, please let me know. This was a very quick video and I will see you on the next one.